Hey everyone, uh, ladies and gentlemen, guys and gals, welcome back to Kochi TV for this um, in our second of our important workout types during the general preparation cross country build up phase. We're looking at short hill runs in this video here. So, something that's really important when we think about cross country, you know, sometimes we'll think about other hills and things like that. And there's different reasons you do hills during different parts of the year. And the fact that they're short hill runs during general prep really makes sense. And we'll talk about the adaptations, how to do this. And kind of briefly touch on some videos we'll talk about later on when the hill runs become a little bit different as the training year progresses. But in general prep, we are looking at this important workout type and we're looking at short hill runs, okay? And the whole idea here is so that we can improve our force production, we're going to improve our running mechanics and our muscle elasticity. And those of you that watched our last video on alactic runs, you'll know that, wow, this is something that we talked about there. And you'll see that there are some similarities between short hill runs and alactic runs, but there's some important differences between the two that would show you why you would do them you wouldn't just do one or the other. You want to have both in your general preparation scheme as you're getting your kids ready for maximum performance in the 5K. Now, here is a, uh, a video from one of our um, workouts. Um, if you haven't seen, I also do workout videos during the season um, where I'll wear a GoPro, there will a GoPro. And this was in one of our hill runs where I turn the GoPro backwards and you can kind of see them all kind of chasing after us. And as you can see from this runner's face, they are pretty taxing, but I'll show you why that they're specifically taxing and they're not going to have an issue in terms of acid development and things like that, but they really will tag you. In a, in a way that other workout types during this time period just won't. So this is one of our short hill interval workouts from general preparation phase last season. And you'll also notice this is not some kind of crazy hill. And we'll talk about the specifics, making this specific to your race. There is a there is a hill here, and you can see it's just very, very gradual. And that's kind of important as we look at how to actually successfully complete these workouts. I am Kyle Giacono. I'm the head of boys cross country and track coach at Wharton High School in Tampa, Florida. This will be my seventh cross country season, and I just completed my seventh track season with the team. Uh, some of my credentials are there on the screen. And just to kind of shout out one kid, we did add, if you've seen my videos, I did add, or we were able to add, I didn't do anything, but the, uh, we had one of our runners sign just a couple days ago with the University of Florida, our javelin thrower, Zach Godbold. So this, move, this number moved up, um, and I'm going to be doing a video on him specifically, but uh, really proud of Zach. Um, even though his season was cut short, so I just want to give him a little shout out here before we get into these hill interval video. All right, so we've gone through all of the critical workouts. If you haven't seen those videos about the workouts that are critical um, for vitally important for success in developing key factors needed for success in the in the cross country 5K, I would go and watch those videos first. And there's even a couple that set these up in terms of planning out the year. But we looked at why these are critical. You must have these. You have to kind of take care of these first. And those are the long run, your VO2 max run, and testing, and your recovery runs. In some cases, these just kind of fall into your training year, and a lot of these also, the important workouts also kind of fall in, as you've kind of seen as we've made that fictitious um, macro cycle, um, focusing on general prep, that a lot of these things kind of fit in with each other because they really do train different things. So we're on the second of these hill of these uh, important workouts. We looked at alactic runs. Again, I would really look at that one first because there's some things we're going to talk about in this one that build off of that. Now we're on hill runs, and these are strength runs, and I don't want to get overboard by talking hill runs just being strength. They maybe train strength more. Running, no matter what you do, is strength work because you're pushing off the, the, the ground with multiple times your body weight, depending on the intensity and a recovery run. It's probably about two times body weight, um, and more of a VO2 max run. It's probably more like three times, and we talked about in the alactic runs, it's more like five times, and it's probably closer to that in the hill runs, but every time you're running, it's strength work. It's a strength run just by the nature of the act, but we're going to improve strength a little bit more readily and different types of strength here with these hill runs. So you might hear me call these strength runs um, when I'm talking about hill runs. So these workouts, these three important workouts for cross country are very important. We have to have them. Um, but the idea being is you take care of the critical, then the important will fill in also. These workouts are so important to cross country 5k success but less so than these critical workouts. Just mentioned this. And then these workout types, special endurance, intensive tempo, and extensive tempo, are not important when it comes to general preparation. These are very important to success in the 5K, but these are for later on because of the peaking of the specific energy system that these tag. So these will become important later on. These are only critical, important, and not important when we're dealing with general prep. And as we've talked about in previous videos, these are the first half of your training year. This is your summer type workout, June, July, and August, and that kind of thing because of how long the aerobic system takes to build. So now we've set that up. 
Always like to talk about the metrics of the race, and we are dealing with the 5K here. If you don't know what the demands of the race are, then you're really just going in blind in the same way if you don't know um, what's going to be on a test, you're not probably going to do very well. So we want to know what it takes to be successful in the race, everything about it. So um, study that was uh, produced by Ingham, I've talked about this several times. Um, they looked at a ton of different metrics to figure out who was the most successful in the 5K. Um, you know, acid tolerance, 400 meter pace, um, uh, running economy. Um, they looked at the proportion of leg length and, and fat composition and all these different things. And they found that the most accurate predictor of who is successful in the 5K is who has the best VO2 max. 94.3% of the time, whoever has the best VO2 max wins the 5K. Um, almost a guarantee. You can't have a guarantee in racing, obviously, but that's pretty close. And the reason for that um, close association comes from the USATF distance curriculum, where we find that the 5K has run very close to VO2 max, 97% of it, just a little bit slower, which makes sense. VO2 max, or the velocity at which your body reaches VO2 max, one of the best tests for it is two miles as fast as you can go. 5K being 3.1 miles is going to be a little bit slower, but it's pretty close. So you can kind of see why that relationship is there. And then this study that I've talked about, um, pretty recent study, 2018 by Dr. Matter and Dr. Hartman. They do a ton of work with IAAF, the international organization that uh, deals with um, track and field. Um, based on the 5K, the three main ways that we get energy to contribute to the one energy system, I sometimes call them three energy systems, but more correctly, we have one energy system with these three components. They found that the available ATP and phosphocretin supplies 4% of the energy. This is what we call the alactic system. I did a whole video on this um, that's in the description down below. Again, I would really look at that one first before looking at this one because there are some similarities here anaerobic glycolytic these um 10 percent. this is your longer speed system that causes acid development the glycolytic system or the glycolysis um is going to be producing that acid and these are the workouts that are important later on in the year but not important now and then not surprising the aerobic system supplies the lion's share of the 5k energy 86 percent but this is a B, right? We're not trying to get a B. We're trying to be as successful as we can. And as successful as we can be with where our kids are. Not everybody's going to win the race. Obviously, we've only got one. But how successfully can we make this kid? Take a kid who's never run before and maybe the first time they run under 20 minutes. And then the next year, maybe get them down to 18 minutes or 17, whatever it is. If they're a boy, if they're a girl, maybe getting them under 25 for the first time or whatever. How can we maximize that improvement? And we don't want them to just get a B. I mean, I'm, I'm also an English teacher at the school that I work with, and we're not trying to get our kids to Bs. We're trying to get them to As. So we're going to have to get these other energy systems contributing. And we'll see that, that hill runs kind of tap into aerobic. They tap into strength, which is not in here at all. And they tap into the cretin phosphate or the alactic system a little bit here. So kind of a couple different areas that hill runs come through because so much is going on when you are running up a hill. So there's not one true energy system that I would highlight and say, this is the focus that we're doing here. Like the last video when I highlighted the alactic system because that's all we were really training with adding some aerobic work in and around those things that we were doing too. And again, I would recommend watching that video too. It's in the description down below. All right, so where do hill runs fit in? This is the USATF distance curriculum I was referring to before, which talks about VO2 max and then measuring paces based on this. I know there is a lot on this screen, but really all you have to know is VO2 max is right here. We've dealt with setting up aerobic threshold or easy workout paces here. We dealt with alactic, which is way up here. We've dealt with some VO2 max um, workouts, which really is 101 to 98%. This probably should be updated. This is about this is from 2016 or 17, so it's a little bit newer data, and, and I mentioned that in a previous video too as well as just where it relates to some other paces we talked about 5k is 97 percent so where do hill runs fit in and unfortunately they just really don't as i mentioned before there's not a, a true pace that we were dealing with um in, in some of these previous workouts so and we'll talk about how you can make this so this is a little bit more on feel and things like that with your kids not everything can be set up with a pace and a watch some of these things have to be from self-pacing and, and from cross country a lot of that is really important so I want to briefly talk about there are five motor performance abilities that go into any athletic competition so every athletic competition is going to include some aspect of these five motor performance abilities and this is from the USATF distance curriculum um, all, all their entire curriculum not just distance but sprints and, and throws and um, jumps and everything but 
these five things make up everything you do in terms of athletics. The question is what percentage of importance are each of these five going to be? And we'll see why running uphill, these short hill runs, are so important to developing different aspects of your athlete's motor performance abilities and their ability to exploit their capabilities in these, these um, abilities. So first one that we're going to think about is distance coaches is endurance, right? This is the ability to work at a given intensity over a period of time, right? Uses the aerobic system and two anaerobic systems. The idea being that all three are turned on at the same time. We think about aerobic when we do with endurance, but we also have these other energy systems and we want to get them some endurance too in their own specific way. Nothing surprising there or earth shattering. Flexibility. We often think about this with, with running, right? We think about wanting to make sure that our kids stretch beforehand and things like that. So this is the ability to move joints effectively. Coordination. This is something that distance kids are unfortunately not the best at. It's probably why they are distance runners. They're great at endurance, but coordination and doing a lot of things in space and and different things, they're not the best at, and this is something that we can focus on with hill runs here. This permits synchronization of two or more body parts, an outcome of how the brain directs um, those body parts. So distance runners are really good at very specific things, right? Hitting the ground over and over again for a long period of time. You ask them to try and do something like hurdles or you know, jumps work or plyometrics, and they're not the most skilled at the beginning because naturally they're better at endurance and coordination is something that maybe lends itself to some of those other events your jumpers your throwers that can do different things with their footwork probably have done some other sports so you obviously get soccer players and, and things like that but you know you might have throwers who are offensive linemen on your football team or jumpers who are maybe volleyball players or something like that and they usually have a little bit better coordination and this is something that we definitely need to have to be successful distance runners also speed obviously whenever you're getting from point a to point b and even a 5k even though it's pretty long you're still measuring how fast you can go not how far you can run so this is something that's important relative to the event not maximum speed maybe but the idea of improving speed in these other areas is something that's very important for the 5k so this is the, the capacity to move the body very quickly uses for the most part, the two anaerobic systems, the endurance system is only going to go as fast as VO2 max, which is relatively fast, but we certainly would not classify it as a speed workout. It's an aerobic workout. It's kind of a crossover. It's very close um, because the limiting factor, as we talked about in the video on VO2 max testing and intervals in the description down below, the limiting factor will be eventually acid development, but not a lot and not in the way true glycolytic work is going to be. So when we talk about speed, we're really talking about those two anaerobic energy systems, and this is something we talked about in the alactic video, and we are going to talk about here today when we're dealing with short hill intervals. And then strength, so force produced regardless of speed of movement without constraints. You sit there and you give somebody an unlimited amount of time to move something, that's type of strength, but typically in sports, we're dealing with strength in a specific way because you have a very short period of time. Even in the 5K, you have to react to different things, change motion in terms of coordination, but that's the type of strength also um, in the ability to produce force in, in a constrained period of time. It's a little bit more important um, in a constrained period of time when you're dealing with things like soccer or basketball or football when there's really a very short period of time, but we need to deal with strength and specific strength in the 5K also. So those are the five motor performance abilities, and we're going to see that three of these, um, and, and in a way, almost four of these can be really tagged depending on how you do these, um, these short hill intervals. So what are the design adaptations of these short hill intervals, and in, especially in relation to those motor performance abilities that we just talked about? All your, More importantly than um, volume or reps or anything like that on the days, you really want to know what you're trying to train that day and then training it. So what are the overall adaptations that we're trying to get out of um, doing short hill intervals? So strength development, one of the things we talked about in the previous um, slide, there's a couple of ways of doing that. So increasing force production, the uh, things we said earlier that all running is strength running, pushing off the ground um, against gravity and with your own body weight. And now by adding the, uh, the hill, we're going to make even more need for force production to get up that hill because we've added that resistance. So that's an element of strength that we're developing. High heart rate is kind of a relation to the fact that we are producing a lot of force. And one of the things I'm going to talk about in the... Um, the design of the actual workout is you're looking for over 180 and there's an easy way that you can measure that 180 in a minute there's an easy way you can measure that uh, during the recovery in between um, and one of the best ways of measuring maximum heart rate is through hill runs so um, that makes a lot of sense that you're going to want to get your heart rate up high here we're not doing an easy run in terms of real low you know 120 to 100 and 40 beats per minute we're trying to get over 180 here at the very least 
Muscle elasticity, this is a form of plyometric work. Hill running is plyometric. I really talked about plyometric work in great detail. But again, the idea of shock training, um, sending um, different um, surges of energy through your muscles to make them more elastic so you get more energy back when you hit the ground. Um, interesting study um, that came out not that long ago basically found that um, you can use 40% less muscle energy in a run because elasticity, when you hit the ground, your muscles are prepared to hit the ground and, and if they hit with a stiff leg, the mu energy comes back into the next step. That's not new muscle energy that's being formed. It is purely free energy. So we want to be somewhat not to the form of like a sprinter or a jumper, but we want the distance runner's muscles to be elastic so we can get less, or get less with more, excuse me, get more with less energy, excuse me, and plyometric work like this is one of the things that's important, and again, I would really watch that alactic video, I talk about this in great detail because that's um, great plyometric work there. Contractile power, your muscles contracting, that's kind of dealing with force production also, and the central nerve, nervous system pathways, getting the ability to produce force that comes not just from the muscles, but your central nervous system sending those um, signals. There's a lot of different ways of improving strength, and a lot of times we think about just getting more muscle mass, but we don't really want that with our distance runners. We don't want them carrying a lot of weight. Another type of strength is your central nervous system's ability to send the um, messages for the force production, the contractile power to happen, um, and that kind of leads the way to doing the muscle elasticity um, through plyometric work. So we've got strength development here. I'm going to call this fake speed development, okay? This is not speed work, not really. I mean, the, the true definition of speed work is alactic work. If you go and ask your sprint coach or whatever what speed, they're going to say basically out to 60 meters or 6 to 7 seconds, and anything longer than that is glycolytic, special endurance, that kind of thing. But a lot of times when you talk about distance coaches, we're talking almost about anything that's not VO2 max or whatever as speed work. So I'm going to call this fake speed work for this reason. It's going to train both anaerobic systems in a way, and this can sometimes be a red flag to distance coaches because they're like, I don't want to develop the anaerobic glycolytic system until later on. Um, get there in one second. But this sort of, it trains the, um, the, the creatine phosphate system, the ATP creatine phosphate system, the alactic system, and the way that we trained it specifically on the Fly 30 and the intervals and, and static starts video, um, it's in the description down below, for six to seven seconds. Because of the amount of time we're giving in between, this system is going to reset, and it fake trains this. Now, it's not speed in terms of getting your body used to running as fast as it can because of the hill, but it's training that system, so it's sort of fake training speed. In the same way that the anaerobic glycolytic system, which 90 to 120 seconds when maximally going, um, is fake training it. But in the same way that you're not truly training speed here, you're not going to be producing acid. The reason being, the hill is going to keep the intensity low. They will not. They, they will feel tired. Their muscles will feel tired, and they might feel sore the next day. But they should not really feel acid because of the way this workout, if it's done correctly, is done. The hill keeps the intensity low enough where acid will not really be produced. Or what I should say is being accumulated. I'm getting ahead of myself here. So, but, so while these systems are being touched on, the hill reduces the intensity, right? Um, you're not going to run uphill as fast as you would on a track or on a field or whatever. Simulates part of speed, a lactic work, and transitions to glycolytic work. The idea of doing this um, in terms of the other energy systems that we don't focus on as much during this time of year, we obviously work on this one we talked about with fly 30s, and we don't work on this one really much at all, is to not get too far away from fast running, right? We talked about 5K is still about who can run fast, and this is a safe way to not get too far away from this or this type of energy system so it doesn't go completely away without truly training it in a way that would be negative for a distance runner, okay? There will be no acid accumulation. That's a better word I should have used. You are developing acid. You watching this video right now are developing acid. It's not about acid being in your working cells because your mitochondria need acid, H plus ions, for the curb cycle to produce its own energy. You don't have any free... Um, hydrogen ions, the acid that's produced from lactic acid, your mitochondria aren't doing anything. Well, now your aerobic system isn't doing anything. And I really talked about this in detail in the alactic video in the description down below, but the idea being, it's not about producing acid. It's about accumulating of acid. Have you built up too much acid to where the mitochondria cannot deal with it on their own? Because when the mitochondria and the enzymes are in the presence of this low pH and the acid for too long, that's when they can start to be hurt and it can hurt your overall aerobic development. 
Because of the way this is done, it's short intervals. The hill prevents a lot of acid from being produced. There's no accumulation if done correctly because of the hill. So that's why you're doing it on the hill. If you try to do this workout not on the hill, it will be a very fast special endurance type workout and you will develop a lot of acid and you will probably start the peak too early. So that's why the hill is the important part of this, the short hill aspect of it. And why the short part of it too, because we'll talk about other um, hill runs later on as you transition to other type of work. Running mechanics, and that deals with coordination, right? As you're running up the hill, your runners have to worry about how they're striking the ground, which also deals with plyometrics, right? They're being prepared to hit the ground, ground preparation mechanics. I'm not on a perfectly pristine track. I'm not on flat surface. So there's a little bit more going on as their foot strikes the ground each time. And the first time they do it, they might be a little hesitant, maybe the second time, but then they get better and better at doing it because they're more prepared to hit the ground. Their mechanics and their coordination is better at striking the ground on this hill, and that'll translate to other types of running. Also, what's really great about this type of hill, and we'll talk about the specifics of how the hill should work, if you pick the right type of hill, they're going to get better knee lift. One of the best way, one of the problems you have with distance runners is their legs trail behind them, they don't get their knees up enough. Um, Faster work can kind of help that. It's one of the reasons why you stride after longer runs to kind of fix mechanics. It's not speed development to, to stride after a long run. You will get no speed development, but it helps with things like knee lift um, and that kind of thing. And the best way to really work on that is not to just tell a kid, get your knees up, because that's not doing anything. It's to put something in front of them like a very um, specific hill, short hill with a certain type of a degree that gets them to naturally have to get their knees up to get the right running mechanics. And when their knees come up, their arms will come down, they'll get better mechanics. If your knees are up, you're not going to be able to slouch over. And that will translate to other types of running so that they are more coordinated in all types of running. Um, just talk about effective arm carriage, same thing. Again, when done on the correct incline type, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And the last piece here, so strength and speed are direct motor performance abilities themselves and running mechanics and ground preparation deals with coordination. So hills are one of the few core workouts that you should be doing, especially in general prep and throughout the year, that can train three motor performance abilities at the same time. When we're dealing with alactic, we're dealing with speed, and we talked about ways that that's also a strength type run, all running a strength type run. When we're dealing with um, longer type runs, VO2 max type runs, tempo runs, we're dealing with strength, but more specifically aerobic. This one gets all three. You're obviously getting some coordination, but because of this hill, you're getting better coordination in this too. So these are one of the few that really can directly target all three types of these things at the same time, okay? Again, I would really mention looking at the alactic runs because it really talks about a lot of these things in a little bit more detail, but the video got a little bit long, so I don't want to repeat everything on it, but... Um, and if this is done correctly, and we'll talk about the fact that these are intervals, meaning you're going to be active recovering, you can get a pretty good amount of volume in on these days too, so you can also train endurance. So we've actually gotten to four of the motor performance abilities. You stretch afterwards, you've hit everything on that day um, as you're doing it. Naturally, what you want in terms of targeting different things to get your kids better at these different motor performance abilities so they can exploit their ability to use these in the race themselves. So let's talk about the actual design of the workout itself. So short hill intervals, what should they look like? What should you be looking like when selecting a location for them? Okay. Well, first off, in sequencing them, you want one per microcycle or every other microcycle in general prep. They're important, not critical. You want to get these in as much as you can. I see these very similar to the alactic runs where I'm, I think I mentioned something about you want to get maybe about three to four. Sometimes you only get two. I would pri pr prioritize this a little bit more over alactic at this point of year because later on you're going to completely abandon hills at the very end of the year when you're still doing some alactic stuff, but the idea being is they're somewhat similar. Every microcycle or every other microcycle, and they kind of come sequenced with the alactic runs in mind. So later on in the year, you'll be doing medium hills and long hills, and the length of the hill changes as the macro cycle, the year-long plan, progresses. All right, so short hill intervals, okay? Intervals meaning incomplete recovery, 
Okay. When we talked about alactic in the last video, we talked about repetitions. Repetitions means near complete recovery. You will not get near complete recovery. One energy system, the alactic system, will be recovered, but the other energy systems, the other things that are going on in their muscles, will not be fully recovered. They're going to have to stop this workout because you're not giving them complete recovery, but that's okay because, again, we're also training aerobic side and all these other things here. So, But the fact that you are not just saying, go uphill as long as you can until you have to stop, because you give the rest interval, and intervals really deal, meaning the, the actual type of rest you're giving them, allows a larger amount of high-intensity work in the same way that we did in um, intervals with VO2 max runs um, in a video we discussed um, a little bit earlier. So what should the hill look like? Most importantly, find a safe hill. Before anything else, make sure it's safe. Um, in the video I'm going to show you, this is um, one that is, you know, it's pretty much just for running, but it's at a place where not a lot of people run. They cut the grass there fairly regularly. The only thing that we make sure we go through, we make sure that there are no holes. I'll bring cones out to mark holes. Sometimes I'll have the kid just put a shirt down or something to kind of mark where a hole is, but make sure it is safe. I've seen this successfully done on um, quiet roads, but obviously you have to be careful with roads um, as you're doing it. Um, just make sure that it is a safe place first. Then, what kind of incline are you looking for? Two to three percent. That's not super, super steep. Okay? It should look like a freeway off ramp. Okay? Two to three percent is not a lot. And you saw, even in the picture they saw, there's a hill there, but it's certainly not crazy. Why wouldn't we want it to be super, super steep? There's obviously cross country courses that have really steep hills. We're not training to run a specific course in your cross-country season and later on we're going to be doing long hills that are more specific to cross-country racing this is to get us not too far away from fast running and the strength and the coordination the other things we're talking about two to three percent means that the running mechanics are the same as if you were on flat ground for the most part or they translate to flat ground that's what i should say because we are getting them to get their knees up a little bit their arm carriage better better upright mechanics that translate to flat ground. If we were running six, seven, eight percent, they're going to have to just really get their knees up. They're going to have to really pump their arms in a way that's going to change their running mechanics for flat ground. That is not good. Okay, two to three percent. Okay, that's kind of the sweet spot. Is it? If it's a, a little bit fluctuating, it's not terrible, but you really want to make it so it's mostly two to three percent, and it's only 120 to 200 meters as you're doing it, right? So make sure that um, I mean, it can obviously be longer. You just mark a place about where they should be stopping as they are going through it. So each rep should be fast, but should replicate should be replicated throughout. So 25 to 45 seconds. So. When a kid asks you, and we talked about it on the, the pace chart before, where does this fit in? As fast as you can go, hitting about the same time every single time. So if it's the one that we use in the video is about 180 to 190 meters, something like that. It's not quite 200 meters. Our fastest kids will come through in about 26 seconds, something like that. Sometimes when they're really going, they'll go a little bit, um, a little bit faster. Um, if it's going to take one of your kids longer than 45 seconds, then you might want them to stop at some point in the rep because they're going to be going a little bit too long and it's going to be a little bit um, taxing other areas of them. You want these to be fast. Like I said, it's fake speed. Think of it that way. These are pretty fast, but replicated throughout. So what you would not want is for the first one, you've got a kid that goes out and runs 26, and then they run 27, and then they run 30, and then they run 32, and it's a regression. You want it to be fairly consistent. If anything, you want the last one to maybe be a second faster than the fastest one they've done throughout. I would start with about four to five reps and build up to eight. Um, when I get to eight, what I'll typically do is halfway through, give them a little bit of a longer break. I haven't talked about rest yet, and we'll do that here in one second. But if you get all the way up to eight, and you can even you can even do ten. There's been times when I've done that um, also. But if you're doing it pretty regularly, eight's a pretty good amount in terms of volume and things like that on the whole day that you're dealing with. Because um, if you do this and you do the recovery, you're going to be getting about two miles total and all this a little bit more and then you've got recovery and everything else afterwards so start small and then build up you're going to be doing these for the entire general preparation phase so you're going to be getting probably about eight to ten of these um, workouts depending on how you sequence them so again that is the first danger point have a safe hill make sure it's not too steep second danger point is the rest as distance coaches we sometimes think that less is more in terms of rest three to four minutes of a jog. That is somewhat extensive. It's extensive in terms of it takes three minutes for 80% recovery for the alactic system. And we talked about we are touching on this. If we didn't give, if we only gave this maybe a minute and a half, 
the alactic system would not be doing. We'd be asking more from the anaerobic glycolytic system, and we might be producing an accumulation of acid. We want some of the lion's share of each of these reps, the first 60 meters of it, could be half of it or a third of it to be coming from the alactic system, and that's part of why we're jogging. But we are jogging, so basically the way this looks is you're going to run up the hill, all the way up it, and then you're going to immediately start jogging. Um, I've heard this say you kind of if you do have a 200 meter hill, if you just jog right back down, well now you've got 400 meters. We typically do more. We kind of jog around a little bit to be able to get to four minutes. So typically we probably get more like 300. We're getting almost 800 ish meters in the rep and the recovery as we're going through. So it's a pretty high volume day if you kind of add everything up. But make sure, give them at least three minutes. Four would actually be a little bit better. If you're doing it in two sets, I would give them maybe five minutes just to get a little bit more of it. Now, one of the things that you uh, you can do, I talked about earlier on, is measuring heart rate to make sure they're going fast as they can, but being able to replicate it. So as they go all the way up, so maybe it's rep three. You probably don't want to do it on rep run, but but say rep three goes up, and as soon as you get done, you tell everybody, check your heart rate, find your pulse, and you count 10 seconds. And they're going to count the amount of beats in that time frame. In 10 seconds, they should be over 30 beats to be over 180 in a minute. If they're not, if they're like 28, 27, they should be able to go faster. So that's one way you can check if they're hitting the right intensity. Okay, pick what made sense for you and your kids. You might want to start with 120 meters and build up. Like I said, ours is about 100, and I think it's 185 meters actually, if I've measured it um, as accurately from start to finish. And the kids know exactly where it is. There's a kind of a fence that marks it, and it's the top of a hill. We'll, I'll show you the video in one second. I've been able to find this in Tampa, Florida, which is one of the flattest parts of the country that you can possibly have. Do your best to try and find something that makes sense that makes sense for your kids in your development, if you're training people, or for yourself in your development, and is safe. So you don't want to, again, actually do this on an off-ramp of a freeway or something like that, right? Do not avoid this. This is an important workout, so make sense. Um, adjust if it takes longer than 45 seconds for less strong or, or conditioned kids. Do not avoid this. Find something that makes the most sense for your situation. That's the most important thing, that it works for your situation, but do not avoid this. All right. One of the things before I show you how to sequence these and show you a workout itself, but to periodize these hill intervals, right? Start with short hills early. So early in general prep, so we said you're going to start with maybe four to five the first time up. Second time out, maybe you do maybe six, um, then maybe six to seven, and by the third or fourth time, you're up to eight. Maybe you get up to ten. One of the things when, when hills have been studied, that periodizing them within the general prep makes sense. So you're going to do them for four to five weeks pretty consistently, about one per microcycle or every other. So you're going to get, in four to five weeks, four to five of these types of um, workouts. That's important. Then, to periodize them to best adapt, go away from them from two weeks, right? Make sure you still have the other workouts that are in there, your tempo runs that we haven't talked about yet, but we will in our next video, alactic runs, everything else that we said is important. Go away from hills for two weeks. That is the best way to adapt. And then come back to them for four to five weeks. They will be faster after they've adapted, and they can handle more. The second time you come back, you can probably start with seven to eight, and you'll get a little bit more out of them, and you'll find that consistently they'll be faster, they'll be able to do their heart rate at a higher level, they'll be able to tolerate more of it. So that is periodizing your hill intervals within the general preparation phase. That is really important. And this is for later on, and you actually see um, these workouts start to appear when we look at this fictitious um, macro cycle of general prep here, just focusing on general prep. But later in the macro cycle, as you pr progress to specific prep, at the end of general prep, actually, it'll start, you're going to progress to first medium hills and then long hill intervals, okay, as you add other types of training in, and we start to look for other reasons to do the hills after we have built things up. Um, like I said, later hills will build on strength from the, the short hills, but will create different adaptations as you get race-specific. As I mentioned this, you do want to sequence this, and I have this one standing out a little bit for this reason. Sequence these with the alactic workouts. We're going to go right after this to look at the fictitious macro cycle. Sequence these in making sense with alactic days. You would not want to do an alactic day and then a hill day afterwards. There's nothing... They could recover in time from that. That's not the issue. They're just training the thing a little bit too similarly. And we have more important things to do in general prep um, that take should take precedence. So it just makes sense, and I'll show you how that can kind of work out, how close. 
they probably should be together and how you can kind of break these up to where you're getting enough of them, but not too much of them, right? So again, these are again still important, not critical, um, with the alactic ones in mind as they are somewhat similar in their effect. So these are high intensity, but just like with alactic workouts, there's no real waste products developed because of the incline, as we talked about before. And the act of recovery or the rest, any acid that may have been starting to accumulate is going to go away because of the three to four minutes and the fact that you're giving the the uh, the, so, the alactic system a chance to recharge, right? So the fatigue really comes from using cretin phosphate. So after the first six seconds, um, the alactic system isn't completely gone, but it's not producing a ton of energy. And that lasts only three to four minutes, hence the rest that we're giving you. There is going to be muscle soreness that's going to be fatiguing. And this is going to be a pretty good aerobic day too, because as you do the active recovery, you're not really stopping. Your heart rate, as we talked about doesn't uh, in uh, previous videos about aerobic central VO2 max development, we talked about in recovery workout, recovery run video and long run video. The aerobic system isn't going to reset because of the act of recovery, so this is going to be a pretty good aerobic day too. Like I said, you're going to get at least, if you do eight of these, you're going to get more than two miles um, in on continuous running with the changing of the pace in the same way when you do intervals VO2 max, you're getting the same thing. But these, the first time you do this, the muscles are going to be sore in the same way that I mentioned with alactic workouts, they're going to be sore the first time you do it. But after you've gotten used to it, after about maybe the first three times or so, the actual fatigue to the muscles, the aerobic system, is going to wear off in 12 to 24 hours. So just like a lot of these other workouts, this is going to make sequencing very easy because they only take 24 hours. You could do this and come back after you've done it a couple times and you're through the initial um, shock of, of the new type of training. You should be able to do anything the next day. In fact, my our sprint coach at our school tells me stories about how when he was in college, his coach would have him do hill runs the day before a meet because it doesn't develop the acid and all the things that we talked about previously. It wears off in 24 hours. So this makes sequencing easy, which is good because you do have to keep the alactic workouts in mind and some of the other things that are a little bit more important to deal with. So here's our fictitious macro cycle looking just at general prep, June, July, and August. Again, this is fictitious. This is in a perfect world. I don't know where um, your state of association or your, your county or whatever it is that um, judges with your how you're able to work with your kids. But right now, at least us in Tampa, Florida, we're not allowed to work with our kids in any way, shape, or form. So this is 100% fictitious. In a perfect world, if you were to, they're probably doing some easy stuff the week before this. I talked about in previous videos and planning this out, but truly general prep um, week one would have started right here. In a perfect world, if you are building to a state meet for cross country, that is on September, excuse me, November 7th, um, that is what ours is scheduled to be in in florida hopefully that plays out if yours is at a different time you might want to play around with it but this is a 23 week macro cycle and this is looking at general prep so how can we schedule these things in and i've left the other workout types on as we've gone through the different videos you'll see the recovery runs are in here you'll see the long runs in here the alactic runs the vo2 max testing and intervals are in here and you'll see how these different holes are now being filled so in the first week Week one of general prep, this will be the third workout that you might want to do. Get them in there, get a couple of runs on them early on, and then you've got this kind of going on in the first week. And as you'll see, I've got two days in between, and then I've got fly 30s. That's as close as you would ever really want to do them. In this first week, um, we don't have a ton of different workouts going on, so there's going to be some repetition quite a bit. This is as close as you would want to do them. Then we come back the next week, no alactic runs. We've got short hills back-to-back -back weeks separated by, what is that, 7, 8, 9, 10 days. Next week, we've got alactic, but we have no short hill intervals, but we've got short hill intervals, what is that, uh, 9 days after the fact. So we're still getting them pretty regularly in terms of the days, maybe not just looking at a true week, if that makes sense, right? So we've got our third one here. Our fourth one is going to come in the fifth week of general prep here in July, as I'm going to click to that. So right here, here's our short hill intervals. And then as I mentioned, periodizing it, we're going to have no hills for two weeks. So no short hills, no short hills. You've got a lactic in both of those again, because this system doesn't really go into a periodization. You can kind of train this throughout the year. We talked about why that is in the video on a lactic. But again, you're kind of pairing these up in and around the short hill intervals. 
And I'll also talk about why you're going to want to do something like recovery runs or long runs the day before. Similarly, like we talked about in the alactic video, why you would do that. But those are the two things we're looking at. Where are the alactic workouts when we're putting in short hill intervals? Where are the long and recovery runs? Because you like to have them the day after if you can, and I'll explain why in a little bit. And then your periodization of not having hills. So we've got through five weeks, we've got four hill runs. That's good go away from it for two now we're back in general prep eight you would probably start with where you left off here or maybe take off one so probably seven to eight something like that here same thing they can do it boom they come right back with the very next week that was right here so we do have if we've got we had a lactic for two weeks we don't have it and then we've got a lactic right here again two days away from the short hill intervals. And then, as I mentioned, you're gonna start seeing medium hill. So this transitions you from general prep to specific prep. Why you do medium hills is a little bit different. So what you'll find is that we had, what is that, four, five, six short hill interval workouts in general prep, and then we've built up enough strength to where we can go to a slightly different type of hill for a different reason as you are transitioning away from general prep and into specific prep. And as we look at specific prep, I'm actually going to come back and talk about medium hills here and why they sort of bridge the gap as you get into different workouts for specific prep. And this would be our second periodization of no hills as we start the specific prep part of the year. So that's how these fit in to a fictitious macro cycle of how you can get these short hill intervals in, but they're pretty easy to kind of pencil in as long as you're keeping in mind the alactic workouts. And it's great to have these the day after something easy at aerobic threshold, like a recovery run, a long run, recovery run, recovery run, long run, um, recovery run before medium hills. It's kind of a great way to do that. But there is, as you probably did see, we've got a lactic run in the medium hills. But again, the reason why you do medium hills, very different. And we'll see why that makes sense in future videos. This is one that we did. Must have been kind of toward the middle or end because we're doing eight on this day with three to four minutes active recovery. Again, as you can kind of see from this picture, it's not incredibly steep. But after you've done one or two, the kids will certainly know they're there or you will know you're there if you um, are doing this yourself. So just kind of take you through this i'm going to go ahead and mute this actually kind of show you how this works so it's just me saying set go here as they all take off again we're going as as fast as we probably can and be able to replicate it i think this may have been the first rep of the day if i remember correctly and just kind of let this go there's a hole right there and a shirt on top of it as i mentioned as we just passed the idea of trying to make sure that it's safe for you and your runners as they kind of go all the way up, all the way up. Again, not super steep, but they're not having to go crazy with their mechanics to get to the top of this hill. And as they get to the top of the hill, they kind of collect themselves for a second. As you can see, they're starting to jog. And this is what it looks like in between. Just very easy jogging. We came up that, and we're going to go back down the hill here in a second. But that's the idea. Just jump right into it so if any acid develops, you can get that out of your system. This is one of the latter ones, so I flipped the GoPro behind my head and got a little head start to let them give me someone to chase. I wanted to go a little bit faster. I think this is the second to last rep is usually when I do this, and it gives them a reason to go a little bit faster. As I said, you want them to go faster on the end of this workout. You can kind of see the grimaces on their face as they get up. You can see really good knee lift. In fact, I'm going to go back a little bit. You can see really good knee lift, really good arm carriage, and everybody's upright in their posture because of the specific nature of this hill not being too too steep really well this kid's running mechanics are always a little bit side to side but for the most part you can see the knees and the arms and everything are pretty decent and it's being helped by the hill itself as they get all the way up to the top here this would be the last rep i usually just kind of film this one off to the side they're kind of sort of pseudo racing the last one because it is the last one. There's nothing really to save yourself for. You can see the gap is not as maybe pronounced between them as you saw in the other ones. Really good solid mechanics just like on the other ones as they come through here. As they close out this day. Not too complicated. Kids can actually do this on their um, their own if it doesn't work out for their schedule or for some reason um, you can't be there or something. This is something that they can definitely manage after you've set up the importance of the, the recovery and everything in between. So, All right, so wrapping this up, what does this kind of pair um, very well or great with um, doing your, your hill runs the day of um, or in and around it? So 
Long cooldowns are fantastic on this day. Going three miles at an easy pace afterwards can add some volume to the day. Do it based on heart rate, not the paces that you've set up for your recovery runs and long runs from previous videos we've talked about, um, because they're going to be a little bit sore and, and, and tired from the day, so it's not going to be that pace, but you're looking for the heart rate um, at this point. It's going to add to your overall aerobic development. We typically get about seven miles on these days. Sometimes it's closer to eight. As you're doing this, because of the reps, the active recovery, you've warmed up in some way. Um, we warm up about a mile, mile and a half. Um, and then this on the back end. So you get a pretty decent volume um, on this day. This is fine as long as it's on the back end. Do not try and have your kids go on a recovery run of, you know, four miles and then do this. It won't be as fast. It's not as critical as I mentioned on the alactic day in the description down below, but same thing. If you want them to be relatively fast and train your fake speed as we've deemed it on this day, then it needs to be at the front when they're most fresh. Relaxation techniques. We're talking about still on the day of. Um, so after the cool down and you're stretching whatever it is that you do, um, your three miles and then your stretching routine probably. Um, and I've talked about this in previous videos, the um, VO2 max interval video in the description down below. Just five minutes, five to 10 minutes. Find a place where they can have their legs propped up. Um, great places on a bench because if they do it on a bench, they use almost no muscle energy to just have their legs up. But maybe on a fence or a wall or something like this. We look kind of funny sometimes when we're doing it at the track because we will do it up along the fence along our track and just a bunch of kids doing this. But their legs are up. Their eyes are closed, and they're just relaxing. Try to make it to be very little to no talking. Just You want them to just slowly relax, bring that heart rate down um, to a little bit easier level, get the blood redistributed throughout the body so it can help with um, the recovery process overall. Um, long runs, and I actually talked about recovery runs. I talked about this in sequencing. Long run the next day or the day before is my preference, actually. You saw I was doing that. Um, may have been that it happened um, regularly afterwards, but my preference is to do it the day before, especially the long run, same way it was with the alactic workouts. This works to complete opposite energy systems. Um, sequencing workouts isn't about easy day, hard day, because this is a relatively challenging day. It's about mixing up the energy systems you are stressing and resting. So long run, recovery run is training something completely different than what you're, for the most part, doing. The three miles easy is the same thing, but this isn't like going out on your long run for 90 minutes or whatever. So you're really kind of working on something very different. So this changes the pace. You go out on a long run, say you're in really good shape, you're in the middle of general prep and you're doing a 90 minute long run, and the next day you come back and you do eight hills um, of 30 seconds as fast as you can. Well, that's something completely different, and it mixes things up. So again, you're getting the critical, the long, or the recovery, and you're mixing it in where it best makes sense, these other types of workouts, the sequencing. Lifting makes a lot of sense on these days. Hill work, especially short hill work, is all power-related um, as, we're, as we're looking at this. And this is especially good for the types of lifting that's quick reps with fairly high weight done quickly. In the actual rep themselves, right? Quick reps, probably don't need quickly in there all after, but also you want to give a decent amount of rest in between. So maybe you're lifting 85 to more like 90% of your max times four short number of uh, reps fairly quickly. And then you're giving them about five minutes in between in the same way that a lactic work um, is training that. So this works in the same type of strength work if you want to do it on the same day. I try to have my lifting days. You can do them on recovery runs, no problem, but it pairs lifting, pairs great. This type of um, strength work with resistance pairs great with hill runs and alactic runs because of how similar they are. You're training, you're hitting on the same type of thing, so it makes a lot of sense. Um, you're obviously going to be doing other type of strength work, but if you're doing lifting in a weight room or something, these would be the best days to do it, not on some of these other days like a VO2 max day would be very bad to lift. Not very, but you're not going to get anything out of it really because you're too fatigued. A tempo run, you're not really getting anything out of it because you're just too fatigued is the idea. You're going to get the most out of your lifting if you do them on these days. Plyometrics exercises, just like with um, the, the alactic workouts, um, but these are different than we talked about alactic workouts. Longer plyometrics like bounding done before the hills work the same type of central nervous system processes, muscle coordination and synchronization, and the muscle elasticity we are going for on these days. So if you've ever seen your probably your sprint coach or your jumps coach have your kids going out in, in track and they're doing bounding and single leg bounds or alternating bounds or those types of things, A skips for height, A skips for distance, things like that. Those are the all types of longer plyometric bounding that pairs really well on this day. It's a little bit longer 
than sort of short plyometrics that pair great with alactic days. I typically, I don't do this at the very, very beginning. So we talked about periodizing it. The first four to five weeks where you're doing hills, I do not do bounding. The second time when I come back to it, now they're used to it, that's when I introduce the bounding in that second block of hills in general prep. And then I'll also do it on medium hills and long hills later on. The idea of gradually introducing these things as you're getting more fit, you're getting more specific to the actual race, that's how you can add these in, and it pairs great with um, what you're doing on these days. So um, if you like this video, please think about liking or subscribing. If you uh, found this helpful, please share it around. I do about uh, three to four videos, th three to five videos or so a week on uh, different aspects of running, going through um, cross-country general prep. The next video we're going to look at is tempo running or lactic threshold running, probably what a lot of coaches think about, and I saved this for the very last one workout type for a reason um, as we get into it and, and that'll come out in the next day or two um, for lactic threshold type running so make sure to check that out um, again hit subscribe hit like if you did find this helpful in any way questions or comments please ask them down below i'd love to answer them um, as we go through it um, you may have a question on something i described too much or on a specific situation that i would love to to help out on in any way that i can so um, next video tempo run lactic threshold runs and until next time this has been coach etv